Tavani, he is the co-founder and head of product at Scout Mob. Scout Mob, which I'm sure most of us in Atlanta are familiar with, they were named one of the top apps in all categories by Wired and Mashable, um, and they're one of the country's most promising companies by Forbes. So let's give it up for Michael Tavani. How you guys doing? Thanks for coming out, spending your Friday morning uh, with me and us. This is, a, this is actually the first one I've been to. We have a Friday morning Scout Mob uh, management meeting, so I've never been able to make this, uh, but I've seen a bunch on video. Uh, so anyway, thanks for coming out. So uh, it's early, so let's kick this thing off. Um, so there's one main theme this morning, and that theme is stick to itiveness. All right, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I've done a bunch of speaking uh, over the last couple of years, and I've rarely been able to use an ironic uh, slide with Comic Sans and, and uh, stretched images, uh, so I, I had to do that. All right, so the real theme of this is top 43 lessons I learned the hard way in Wish were in my moleskin in 2007 when I was sitting in the back of a room like this trying to soak it all in. So I've learned a ton, and I want to share a couple of things with you. So... Uh, one, uh, this is just a little background on me. I was in the entrepreneurial closet for the first 25 years of my life. Uh, I was an entrepreneur. I didn't know it. Um, I had no examples of entrepreneurs. I, I didn't have any example of what one looked like. And so um, I didn't know what the career path was. And, and at around 25, and I have a story, um, I kind of realized that I was an entrepreneur and that's what I wanted to do. So I went to law school. And in law school, uh, I was studying in the library. And uh, I'd study for an hour, and then I'd take a little bit of a break. And uh, I'd, I'd take a break for 10 or 15 minutes. And I saw this book, AOL.com. It's about the starting of AOL. And, um, and I realized after a couple of hours that I was spending an hour reading this book and 10 minutes studying. And so it was the opposite. So I realized at that point when I looked back that this is what I should be doing with my life more than, more than what I was doing. So... Um, I'll start with this. Now is the best time in the history of the world to start something. It doesn't have to be a company. It could be a, pro a project, a nonprofit, a get a job campaign, a documentary film, but it's the best time in the history of the world. I'll give you a couple reasons why. Kickstarter. So everyone has distribution to the whole entire world, and that's never existed before. If you're a creative, you're limited only by your creativity. So if you're a documentary filmmaker, you can raise $200,000 and make your film on Kickstarter. So this guy, Johnny of the A, I don't even know who this guy is, but I started following him on Instagram. This guy, to me, is more influential than the biggest fashion magazines, because I follow him, he posts pictures of what he wears every single day. And now I follow this guy, and he's more influential than the best magazines in the world, and he's just a guy with a couple thousand followers. Pretty amazing, the distribution that exists today. So I'll say this. I, I meet with a ton of entrepreneurs all the time, most, mostly at Octane, and every entrepreneur is waiting for the perfect idea, and there is no perfect idea. No ideas are good on paper. I think everyone wants their dive into starting something to be this graceful and this beautiful. <laughs> jumping with the sunset there. It usually looks <laughs> a lot more like this. And it hurts just as bad sometimes, too. So I had a similar ugly dive into a baby pool. That's me in the gorilla suit in the top left, starting my first company. And that's 2007. I didn't know what I was doing, but I jumped in. And you'll figure it out as on the way down, even if it's only two feet. And uh, that led to the next company, which was Skyblocks, which led to Scout Mob. So each step along the way, I learned stuff. And in some ways, I say I'm still on my first startup. Um, even though I jumped in on that first one, I learned a lot along the way. So jump in, because you won't learn things unless you jump in. I wouldn't have learned about Skyblocks. I wouldn't have figured out Skyblocks unless I had jumped in. It's hard to, to learn that stuff on the sidelines. 
it's all about execution. It really is. So there's a lot of entrepreneurs that are waiting for that idea, but I always feel protected at night knowing that if you can execute, it doesn't matter how good the idea is or how bad the idea is, you can make it happen. I think the idea is about 1% execution is the rest. So just to give you a real world example, does anyone recognize that icon on the right? That's Hipstamatic. I remember when I downloaded that app, and it was very similar to Instagram, about six months before Instagram, and I thought it was pretty neat. And then six months later, Instagram comes out, and they out-executed Hipstamatic in all aspects, the user experience and everything. And everyone knows probably the end of this story, Instagram was sold for a ton of money, and Hipstamatic, I don't even know what they're doing. They might have got kicked off the, the app store. <laughs> So I'm a big believer in telling everyone your idea. I think a lot of people are afraid that people are going to steal your idea, that they're going to do it. As I mentioned earlier, execution is the key. So as long as you can execute, it doesn't matter what the idea is. I'm happy to tell you anything about Scout Mom. Um, and I'm an open book. And I find that people, when you tell them um, you know, their ideas, they usually kind of let their guard down. They're willing to tell you everything. So I meet with people all the time. I tell them things that are working, things that aren't working, our revenue our investors, everything. So I'm an open book. Tell everyone your idea. You'll end up getting a lot more out of them uh, by telling them. So I actually met, this is the co-founder of Scout Mob, uh, Dave Payne. I met him through a coffee meeting where we both were starting companies and we both shared everything that we were kind of learning and we decided at the end of that meeting or at the end of a couple of meetings that we should work together. Octane. Uh, I do a ton of meetings at Octane, and uh, a, at least a few a week, and, I, and that's kind of, this is the place where I tell everyone everything, so if you want to know everything about me, <laughs> meet me there. So find a wingman with complementary skills. It's extremely tough uh, doing, doing this, and there's obviously a lot of ups and downs in starting anything, um, and so you've got you to gotta be in it with someone. It's really hard to do it by yourself. Um, ideally, you'd find someone who, who has skills that are different than yours. So the next startup that I do, I'll probably partner with a web developer or maybe a designer. Uh, but you've got you to be in it with someone. Hiring for passion. Um, this is a, a, a huge thing for me. So I don't care about resume. I don't care about your background. All I care is that you're passionate about this. Everything that we're doing, everything we're doing at Scout Mob, and everything probably a lot of the people in this room are doing is interesting. And so people need to be passionate about this. This isn't a job. This isn't a nine to five where you check out. Uh, this is about passion. And so one of the tricks that, that I use, and it seems to have worked really well, is after I interview people, I always try to send them an industry article and keep it pretty open-ended um, and see what their response is. Um, and, I, and, I, and I'll usually send it late at night or on the weekend. And I'll see if they either respond 10 minutes later or if they respond on the weekend. And I love to see their response. Some people will send me paragraphs back, and then they start sending me articles, and I realize that they're passionate about this. And that's the real key. You want to have passionate people. And that's what allowed us to go from just a couple of people to a bigger group, to a little bigger group, to a bigger group. So this is Scout Mob last summer, I think. And that's what allowed us to attract guys like this to the team. So <laughs> passion is the key. So you have to do unscalable stuff. I think a lot of people are afraid of, uh, you know, they read in the book and they want that, this sexy, uh, you know, they read all the articles on the, on the cover of magazines and, and that's all they think about is that this is just going to be fun and games. But there's a lot of unscalable things that are involved in the early days and you need to be a doer in the early days and do stuff that, that you know, even an intern wouldn't do, but you're doing it at the beginning. So just to give you an example, uh, before we launched Scout Mob, uh, this is uh, January of 2010. This is about a week before we launched. Uh, we went around, and I think it had snowed the day before, and we went around and hung up these signs to create a little bit of kind of a viral campaign to promote Scout Mob. And so here we are stapling these signs on the street poles all throughout the city, um, but it's this kind of unscalable stuff. I mean, this is, this is you don't think of a, you know, of a $100 million company launching this way, but this is what we had to do to grow our initial base. And we weren't trying to tackle the whole world. We were just trying to get people in Atlanta, in-town neighborhoods, to know about us, and we had to do unscalable stuff like this. So let me move to brand, because brand is a huge thing for Scout Mob, and it's something that we thought a lot about in the early days, and we still think about it uh, today. It's, it's the one thing that we've done well is brand, and uh, we spent a lot of time on it, so I want to spend some time talking about brand. Um, before you do anything, you need to create something remarkable. 
A lot of people worry about all kinds of things. They worry about legal issues, they worry about their business plan, they worry about, um, they're asking the wrong questions when I meet these people. And creating something remarkable is the first thing that you should be worrying about before revenue, before anything else, in my opinion. Because if people don't like your product, if people aren't enjoying it and using it, then it doesn't matter, all this other stuff goes away. So to give you a, a, an example there, the first two uh, people that we hired at Scout Mob were a designer and a copywriter out of Creative Circus. And it's because we were thinking a lot about brand. We're a consumer brand. People have to like and enjoy using us. They have to like our brand. And so um, their names were Liza and Andy. This is not them. But uh, <laughs> I did a search on Google for Liza and Andy, and this picture came up. <laughs> thought that was pretty cool. This actually is them. Uh, and one point about them is they could have gone on and do a lot of different things, and they probably could have gone down the traditional um, path of creatives, maybe gone to an agency or, or, or worked in some jobs where they were writing for, for big companies or whatever. And, and um, they decided to, to take a risk and join a startup. And uh, their experience, which was untraditional at the time, um, ha has been amazing. So they, they built a brand that has two million users and they built it from the from ground up. And so it's a pretty cool thing that they were able to do and I think that experience was something they wouldn't have got anywhere else. So delight in all places. Um, there's so many opportunities to delight uh, nowadays and, you, and even the smallest of details you have to delight. Let me walk you through a couple examples. So this was our page before we launched Scout Mob, before anyone had heard about us. And we were thinking a ton about how could we delight. So if you hit that 42 button uh, on the right-hand side, an uh, animated gift fist bump would, would come out and hit you. Um, this was our map after we started launching some cities. And we put Easter eggs all throughout this page. So there was links all over this page. I think on the Bermuda Triangle pulled up some crazy video. Uh, this was our second version of it. So you see the boat right here is sinking. In the first version, it was sailing. Um, if you hit, you know, western edge of the map, uh, it was like a picture like of the end of the world. So we were trying to delight in all aspects. And a lot of people didn't even see those little Easter eggs. So we had an extra tab in our app. Like this is about a week before we're finished developing it. And we had, there was like five spaces on the bottom of, of the tab. And we had one that we just didn't have any content for. So we were thinking, what could we put in the app that would kind of be delightful? And we, in the last minute, we decided to do this stash cam. And, um, and it, you know, obviously mo a lot of people associate Scout Mob with mustaches. This was us just trying to do something delightful. So this was, these were our business cards when we launched DC. We literally put mustaches on every single business card that we sent out. We also hand stamp our business cards, right? So when everyone starts Scout Mob, they get a business card, they have to hand stamp it um, with their name and their logo. So just delighting in all aspects. Let me tell you the story about sweater vests. So, uh, this is a late night, again, the week before we launched, probably, and we were coming up with our corporate email address. And I think a lot of people would do info at scoutmob.com. That's the standard corporate email address. We decided to do something a little bit different. So we spent probably two hours coming up with a name for our corporate email address. We settled on sweater vest at scoutmob.com. The funny story is, is we probably get three, four emails a week, still to this day, three years later from people who either have a suggestion or a complaint or a thought to us, and they say, let me just start off this email by saying, that's the best email address I've ever heard. <laughs> um, so it kind of diffuses people, still to this day. Average loses on the web every single time. Uh, you, the thing about the web is everyone has distribution, which means everyone has an idea, there's a lot of competition, and your competitor is a click away on the web. So, Think about it. When you go to a site, when you go to an app, within five, ten seconds, you can tell whether this is a place you want to spend some time or not. And, and if it's not, you're out and you're never coming back. Um, so there's, there's a lot of benefits to today with distribution, but your competitors are quick away. You can't be average. This is a pretty real-world example. Uh, I don't know if anyone's heard of Posturus or not, but there was Posturus and Tumblr, which are two blogging platforms, came out roughly the exact same time. They raised almost the exact same amount of money. Posturus was very engineered. They did a lot of A-B testing, uh, and it was obviously measured, ranked, all that kind of stuff. Tumblr was well designed. They cared a lot about the end user experience. If you look and if you Google these two, you'll see their sign-up flows, and Posturus was extremely user-friendly. And uh, you guys probably know this story. Tumblr is, is on fire. Posturus is being shut down, I think, sometime this summer. 
So brand, not technology, is the differentiator today. I think there's so many different ways that you can throw together a site that works in the early days. Eventually, you're going to need to you know, make this thing bulletproof, but you can get a site up, you can get an app out, um, but brand is the real differentiator. And just to give you an example, has anyone heard of Harry's Razors? So this is one of the Warby Parker founders. Uh, I think they launched last week. And this brand, the technology is nothing uh, special, but the brand is really good. The site was probably put up in a couple of weeks. The brand is unbelievable. So I haven't even used this razor yet, and I'm telling all you guys about it. I ordered it last week, and I got it, and I was so wowed by the brand. Um, they literally thought about every single detail. On the back of the shaving cream that they sent, it has you know 7.5 fluid ounces. They even did something delightful there. I forget what it was, but. This brand really delighted. Um, and, and for them, it's about the brand, not about the technology. So no one shares a shitty brand. I always laugh when I see uh, you know, a brand and the site's terrible, and they have share buttons all over the place. No one wants to share that. First of all, everyone knows how to share, so you don't need to tell me how to share. You need to create a brand that I want to share, and then I'll share it. And so I laugh at this all the time. No one will share it. Um, we had a user of ours, we have users all the time that'll come by the office and drop off things. And someone painted this thing and dropped it by our office and it's hanging in our office. And this is the kind of stuff people want to share, a brand that people feel good about, right? So the t-shirt test. Um, it's interesting. I have a ton of free t-shirts from startups, from projects, all kinds of things, and I never use them. I should have brought them today, actually. Um, <laughs> The, 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 the company that's created a solid brand is a company whose t-shirt you want to wear. So these are the Scout Mob shirts, but I think of another real world example, and I'll plug them because they're a sponsor, MailChimp. So MailChimp shirts, I'm very proud to wear, and I wear them all the time. But there's a lot of companies whose shirts I just don't, you know, I, I don't want to wear their logo on my chest. And so we think a lot about the t-shirt test, and actually our sales guys all the time use, hey, people wear our Scout Mob shirts. How many other brands, how many other brands in our space do you see people wearing in their shirts? So here's a, a quick example of the power of brand. Uh, eBay and Amazon, which aren't known for their strong brand, obviously good products, but aren't known for their brand, they're trading at one to two time multiples of revenue. And Under Armour and Lululemon, which are known for their strong brands, they're selling kind of commodity products. You can buy that same stuff in, in, you know, at Target. They're trading at eight times revenue. I, I saw this the other day, and I thought that was a great example of brand. So about that theme. This one, <laughs> stick to itiveness. That's, that's an underused effect. That needs to get used more often. <laughs> Amazing. There were so many I could have used the fire coming up. Unbelievable. Stretched image, too. This theme, reuse. So I've learned a lot of things uh, along the way over the last six, seven years uh, doing this. And a lot of them I learned the hard way. Um, take what, what you know, today, take what, uh, what you want, what made sense to you, but disregard the stuff that didn't make sense. There's a million ways to make it happen, and I'm not going to stand up here and say, these are, the, these are the ways to make it happen. There's a, a lot, you have to create your own path. There's a lot of ways you can make it happen, and you read articles that you have to be an experienced entrepreneur, that you have to be an older entrepreneur, that you have to have experience in this, that you need a developer, and there's a million ways that you can do it. You could be a young guy, you could be an old guy, this could be your first company, your last company, no funding, no experience. And so you've got to make your own path, and there's no one way to do it. So take any of this and use any of this that you want, and I'm happy to share everything else that I have that I didn't get to do today, um, but disregard the things that I say and that other people say that don't apply to you. One thing, I'll, I'll end with two things. Um, it's easy to make an impact in Atlanta. Um, so the, the founder of the, the guy who had the original idea for the Atlanta Beltline, Ryan Gravel, uh, told me this uh, recently, and I thought it was real true. Um, that Atlanta is the type of city where you can impact it. Unlike a New York or a San Francisco or LA or Chicago where the city will impact you, Atlanta you can impact. And the great thing about Atlanta is it's big enough where you have this many creative people in the, in the, on a Friday morning waking up to, to do something. Uh, so it's big enough where the resources are there, um, but you can impact the city. And there's a lot of things happening right now where you can have an impact in Atlanta. Uh, this picture actually didn't have anything to do with anything. I just thought it was a great picture. Um, one of the 
big regrets in my life is that I had an opportunity to buy this poster at Kudzu on a Scout Mob deal, actually, and I didn't do it. Big regret. Unbelievable poster. So I'll end with this, and I, I tell this to everyone. There's nothing better than being in the game. And in the game is, it doesn't have to be the founder of something. It could be involved when it could be an early employee. It could be just part of something or a project or a company changing the world. And so uh, I talk to a lot of people that have ideas, that don't know when to jump in, uh, that, that they, they want to be involved, but they don't know where to start. There's nothing better than being in the game. And I'll encourage all of you guys to, to join me, to get in the game, to do something that's changing the world. That's it. I appreciate your guys' time and, and stay in touch. All right. Thanks, man. That was awesome. Here we are. 22 seconds. Left. Nice. That was perfect. So we'll do uh, some Q&A. So if you have a question for Michael, raise your hand, and then he'll repeat the question back for the video and uh, try to answer as, as best he can. So uh, not all at once. Raise your hand when you have a question. What am I going to do the rest of the day? I'm going to go to Octane and tell a bunch of people Scout Mob's revenue and all our ideas. Um, yeah, so at Scout Mob, I'm the, the head of product. Um, so uh, we're a, you know, product is one of the important, is, in my opinion, it's the most important thing that we're doing. Um, and so that's, that's what people know us by. We're a product-driven company. And so uh, thinking a lot about the product, thinking about how we can delight our users, thinking about how we can create a better user experience. So we're focusing a lot on a product that we launched about six months ago called Shop. Uh, and I don't know if any of you guys have heard of Shop, but it's, a, it's our handmade goods product. It's kind of an e-commerce product, much different than our original core product that most people know us by, which is kind of mobile deals. Uh, and so we kind of launched that as a test uh, six, seven months ago with a really small team. And um, it's really grown a ton. Uh, so we're focusing a lot more of our energy on it. So focusing a lot on Shop and trying to create a really great user experience for people that are buying um, on shop. Uh, so that's, that's probably what I'll do the rest of the day. And then probably leave around three and go home, go to sleep. <laughs> Uh, I think for me, um, it's, it's the, uh, the people that we've been able to bring on. Like, uh, you know, I look around the office and there was, there was two guys at Scout Mob four years ago. And we were, you know, I just would see one other guy, my co-founder Dave, that's it. That's all I'd see for the whole entire day. And now we have people uh, that are having kids that w were, their, were their career, were their job, were their, this is their, they took their opportunity, their risk with us. And so I look around at, at those people and say, now Scout Mob is about those people. Um, so I think that's a huge part of it. It's not at all. It's funny, people who are kind of novices, they think uh, it's about selling or it's about, uh, it's not about that at all. I think it's about doing something fun. I mean, for me, I'm having a great time. I want to keep this going forever. Um, and so I want to personally just have fun every day and I, I don't want to have a job. I want to have something where when I go home at night, I can't tell if I'm working or, or having fun. So. That's what it is for me personally. I think for everyone else, it's creating an unbelievable atmosphere. And I'm a consumer product guy. Like I love doing, I only ever want to do products that consumers touch. And so it's, it's amazing to be able to develop a product that people are able to use. And you know, a lot of people in the room will have used the product or they come up to you and they've used it. So that's what it's about for, for kind of me and the company. Yeah, so she was asking, curious, uh, what, what she sees in the future for us five to ten years from now. Um, we probably only think about six months out. Uh, it's funny, um, you know, people all the time, they're like, so where are you going to be ten years from now? And I'm I have no clue. Um, yeah, so we, we think like six months out, probably max. Uh, actually, right now, we're thinking 60 days. So we're thinking, how can we have an impact in shop in the next 60 days? Um, if I had to guess five years from now, um, we'll, we'll continue to be pushing these two products that we have. We're, we're considering ourselves a transactional media company, which is kind of a new term that we came up with, um, where we have two products that are both transactional. We don't do advertising. Um, and both of these products make money from transactions. So one of them is, is local deals going into a business and 
and using it. And, uh, and the other one is shop where we're actually selling handmade products. Um, and so we'll, we'll add on anything else that makes sense to our users. So we're kind of curating things, whether it's restaurants or products, to users and we're surfacing them up. Um, and so, you know, I've said this all the time, if, if Scout Mob users happen to like green shoes, then we'd put green shoes, you know, and we'd, we'd, we'd curate those for our users. So we're going to continue to add on products that make sense to, to our user base. And our user base is, right now, is kind of a, a you know, probably in the 20s, 30s, uh, probably someone that lives in town, creative kind of uh, person uh, who, who likes to go out, uh, support kind of independent businesses and support like independent artists. Yeah, so how do employees participate in, in the end game of Scout Mob? So every single employee uh, gets equity in the company, and that's a, it's funny, in, in Atlanta, that's not as common of a thing. There's, there's a lot of startups that don't do that. But every single employee gets ownership in the, in the company, and that's a big thing that we use in the early days. I, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I gave the speech where, listen, what we can't do in salary, we're going to try to do in equity, and that, that's what we're going to, you know, ultimately, we're all going to own this thing together. And so... Uh, that's a huge thing for us. Like you want people to feel invested in, in what you're doing and, and it's not just kind of a job for them. Uh, in San Francisco, that's every single company does that. Here, not as many. Uh, but we do that for every single employee. And so uh, if you came to our office as well, you, you would know who's running the show and who's not. So everyone, you know, everyone has an opportunity to step up and, and run a particular area. So I think that's another one where it's, it's really a... Uh, meritocracy, where we just let people, um, you know, people that step it up will step up and, and, uh, and make stuff happen. When did you know it was time to quote unquote fire your boss and just go on with Scout Mob and not worry about, you know, it being a startup and really embracing the aspect of starting your own business? Yeah, so uh, directly before uh, Scout Mob, you know, or before my first company, I was in law school, so I wasn't, I wasn't actually, I didn't have a boss then other than my loans. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, when I graduated law school, I actually got married that summer, and, and I was on a my honeymoon, honeymoon with my wife, and uh, I brought a ton of like business magazines to read on the honeymoon, and uh, I, I told my wife, I said, uh, I said, I'm not going to go get a job, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start a company. And, Everyone thought I was crazy at the time because uh, I had just gotten a law degree and I think a lot of people were asking me what law firm I was going to and I said, no, 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 I'm starting this site where I'm dressed up as a gorilla at a Georgia Tech football game. <laughs> Next creative morning speech, I got to tell you the story about the gorilla suit, um, but I actually did buy a gorilla suit and uh, wear it to try to hawk uh, this company that I was doing. Um, so, so for me, it, it, and the funny thing is, is it felt right. I didn't make money for maybe over a year. Um, and I had just graduated from law school, I had these loans, and, uh, but it, it felt right from the very beginning, and so everyone was questioning it from the outside, but for me it felt right. Um, and like I said, I was kind of a, you know, in the closet about being an entrepreneur, but the second I kind of dove in, uh, I knew it was the right thing. Um, and so, anyway, it, I think it's different for everyone, and I, I realize that there's financial considerations. That's probably the, the biggest obstacle, and there's a lot of people that say, well, I have a job, I have a kid, you know, how do I do it? You can do it at night, you can make it happen, uh, save up your money, have six months of time where you don't need to make money, or just do it at night and, and get progress and then continue to go from there. Uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, this, it kept coming up about the lighting people in terms of the presentation of your business, um, then it sort of backs down into starting the business and giving people ownership of the company, looking for passion, um, can you speak to just like how deep that perspective of looking to delight people or help people like goes in the process of even choosing like what you do, how you target, you know, what you go after? Just yeah. Kind of the whole big picture, not just the. Yeah. So I'll give you, I'll give you a, a good example. We, we have, uh, for about two years, we didn't have anyone in the company who was kind of a data analytics guy. So we made all decisions from the gut. Just decisions that felt right, uh, and we would build products that felt right. Not, not based on data, just ones that felt right. Two years in, we hired this young whippersnapper analytics guy, and he was, he was a sharp guy. He had done it before at another startup, and he came in, and now we had data. So this guy was like the rock star in the company. So now we were making decisions based on real-world data. People used this button. They didn't use this button. People bought this. They didn't buy this. 
And I realized about six months in um, that the truly revolutionary uh, products and decisions that we make are still made from the gut. And we can use data to optimize those decisions and tweak those decisions, but we still make big, big decisions that are, that are company changing from the gut. And so just as an example, Shop, that product that we launched, was, was the decision we made from the gut. There was no, there's no amount of data that could tell you a new product that you've never launched before that not that many people are doing is going to do well or not. And we decided to do it. It felt right. Um, and so we launched it. And in fact, a lot of our pages that we build, uh, there's, there's some data as parts of them, but you don't want data to drive the whole decision. We still say, ah, that doesn't feel right. Even though this button beat this button, we're just going to go with the gut. And so we make a lot of decisions that way. What do you think Groupon's done wrong? So they, they did a lot right in the, uh, you got to give them a lot of credit for a couple of things and then they, they've done a lot of things wrong. But uh, what they did right is they created this industry. So they basically took Woot's model. I don't know if any of you guys have heard of Woot, but they took that model and they applied it to local businesses and that was extremely disruptive and innovative at the time. And it was one of the best things ever for local businesses. Um, what they did wrong, and you can't even really blame the leaders for this, uh, they raised way too much money. So I actually think local, just local uh, in general, has a cap to it. It's really hard to do local because Scout Mob's not the type of company where we can just, we are with shop, but we weren't with our local product where we can just turn it on and we're live in every city in the U.S. We had to launch city by city, know the city, hire people in each one of those cities. So Groupon raised so much money um, that, that they had to become this gigantic company that was too big for local. And they started getting away. In, in the early days of Groupon, if, you know, if anyone knew Groupon in the really early days, they launched November of 2008 in Chicago, um, they, were, they were pretty neat. Even in the early days of Atlanta, they used to do restaurants. Um, their early days in Chicago, they'd do Cubs tickets, and they were doing all these unique experiences. Then they raised so much money that they had to be everything to everyone, and, and that was too big for, for them, and they, they, it, it, it really messed up their brand. So... Uh, I think they, they grew too fast, they raised too much money, and it, it just wasn't healthy. One more question. Who are your uh, top competitors for both, your project, for both your products, and how do you differentiate yourself? Yeah, who are our top competitors? So um, in, the, in the mobile side, uh, we actually never consider our, our biggest competitor like other deals companies. We just always considered it companies that were doing other things local mobile, because that was... Your attention span, you're not going to go to a restaurant and before you go to that restaurant, pull up three apps. Uh, so we always viewed anything, you know, as a, as a Yelp, as a uh, Foursquare, anything where you're doing discovery in a local way on mobile was our competitor for the, for the mobile product. And we actually uh, did a partnership with Foursquare. So we didn't really consider them competitors, but it was just attention span. I mean, uh, people are only going to open certain many, so many apps a day. And then on the, on the shop side, which is, you know, handmade products, um, I actually, I don't, there, there are some competitors, none that are huge. There's a, there's a bunch of people kind of doing it in a small way, and I think it's, it's, um, it's growing a ton. But we kind of consider ourselves Etsy-like products sold in a fab-like way. So it's kind of a flash commerce, um, but it's Etsy-like products. And I wouldn't consider either of those two really competitors. Etsy's a marketplace. Uh, we're not a marketplace where you can just upload a product and sell it. Um, but there's a bunch of smaller players, uh, Uncovid and some other smaller ones, but none that are huge that any of you guys probably have heard of. So we're hoping to, to be a leader in that space. Let's give a round of applause for Michael. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, man. Well, thanks so much.